Hello everyone this is part 27 of what if Naruto learned the secret of shadow clone, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Evening had descended upon Azushio, finding Naruto in a bit of a pleasant back and forth with Mei after she and her group had explored the city for the afternoon. Behind him stand Zen and Jugo in the corners of the wide meeting room they had decided to use instead of his office. It still offered a wonderful view of the city, the orange and slowly turning purple light from the setting sun spilling in. Chojuro and Ao guard the other end of the sparsely decorated room behind Mei, faces carefully neutral. Hanata and Ino sit on either side of Naruto at the meeting table, Ino listening on carefully while Hanata takes notes and has unsealed a few folders worth of notes and resource paperwork. Naruto grins a bit as he relaxes back for a moment, I hope you've enjoyed your first day here in Izushiogaku. It's great to have you here. He wouldn't admit that it took some effort to keep his eyes on her face, lovely as it was. The auburn-haired woman was an absolute bombshell, not that he would admit that out loud. Jiraiya would absolutely lose his mind around her. Mei nods with a smile, your city is breathtaking really. The people are so driven and focused and your advancements extend not just to ninja but to your civilians as well. We have been enjoying ourselves immensely. Your leadership is regarded with high esteem as well we've learned. She had heard nothing but praises about the Uzumaki head along with the rest of the clan. She had taken Kotohin's advice and paid homage to the Uzumaki memorial as well, which had seemed to help ease or resolve some of the people's misgivings about them. Nodding along Naruto felt a bit of pride well up in his chest, we have all worked hard to make it this far. I couldn't be happier about our reconstruction so far. It is here that Naruto leans forward a bit as he focuses, but, you're here on business. So, his eyes tense up a bit, about your conduct when you arrived. It's really not a good look for a visiting dignitary to bypass a security checkpoint, civilian or otherwise. Honestly he wasn't all that worried about it, but this was about negotiations, which meant he couldn't let it slide without some notice. Yes, about that, I can do nothing except apologize profusely. More than just an oversight, we had made the incorrect assumption that there was a larger separation between the civilian and military functions within your country. Probing a bit for information while sincerely apologizing, May did hope he was not one to hold grudges. Naruto waves it away eventually, I guess I can overlook it for now, we do have systems in place to keep track of ninja within our borders after all. Deciding to give some of her own information away in hopes that he might do the same, May motions to Ao, is that so? My subordinate had been scanning with his Byakugan and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Hopefully the young Hugo next to him didn't take offense to having their vaulted eye stolen, but it was most likely well before her time. Grinning and glad for the confirmation that their seals were in fact working as intended, Naruto's face relaxes out of his frown, concealing Uzumaki seals is easy enough for us by now. Leaning over, Hanata quietly hands him a folder that he opens and begins turning pages of paper within. Let's see now. We first detected you coming from the east by boat just outside of Azushio territorial waters. Hmm, 0700 you detour around our main island and away from the whirlpools. You dock at wave by 0800, slip away from your escort by 0810, and eventually wander through the city for about 30 minutes. Hmm, Chojuro picks his nose approximately five times during your exploration, Al casually spits into the street three times, and you admire yourself in a window twelve times. Naruto levels a smug grin at the group, should I continue? Mei blushes a bit as she chuckles, no no, I think we get the message. Azushio is very thorough I see. I always make sure to take care of everything until the end. He misses the light blushes from Hanata and Ino. But I want to make it clear from the get go. We knew you had entered our country well before you were within any type of striking range. Azu will not fall again. Certainly not from a combined assault from the major villages like last time. We would never dream of doing such again. Mei shakes her head while tapping a finger on the long granite desk. The Kiri of today is very different from the Kiri of old. We are looking to make amends and show everyone that we are a changed people. Which was the truth. Mei did not want Kiri to continue to be known as the bloody mists after all. 
Hopefully her sincerity could reach the young leader. Naruto opens his mouth to say something but Ino leans over to whisper in his ear. She is being sincere, of that I'm sure. Maybe cut the cutie some slack. Wouldn't she just be divine to have laid out on our bed? You know, to apologize for her misstep earlier. Naruto had to of course keep his face neutral as he nodded and leaned away from the Kamino. Brat. Now his head was full of dirty thoughts. We are island nations. So it would probably be best for us to get along. I'd hate to have bad relations with our neighbors. I have much of the same belief. May mentally sighed with some relief, happy that they had at least some hope of negotiating properly. Naruto leans his elbows on the table while tenting his hands together, so how are things in Kirigaku right now? You've been in isolation for years now. Sighing heavily May relaxes back in her own chair, things have been, rough, to say the least. Reconstruction is slow going and the civilians are wary about trusting my administration. Never mind some of our ninja clans who had previously been prosecuted during the bloodline purges. Having to win their trust is going to be the hardest barrier I believe. More like impossible. May had rallied many of those behind her on the belief that they would change things for the better. However it wasn't like they could kill everyone who had supported the old system. It was a headache and a half to keep things going and it gave her less and less time every day for her own life. Truly being a cage was a lonely existence. See her pause, Naruto nods along, Azushio can help with reconstruction efforts, though I'm sure you understand compensation will be expected later. Manpower isn't something we are short on. It might spread him a bit thin, but if it secured a new ally, he'd happily go and get some work done. Plus he could see a new country, maybe come up with new ideas and the like. Thinking about the proposal, May instead worries about some of the ninja clans under her control. Not all of them were willing to trust her or Kiri as a whole. Minds did not change overnight. Reconstruction was slow yes, but it would happen. Instead of reconstruction assistance, how about instead you assist us with immigration? Seeing she has his attention, she continues with her pitch. There are a few clans under our banner that are still, jumpy. They've considered leaving Kiri altogether, though many of their techniques and livelihoods rely on being near or on the ocean. So they stay more out of necessity than loyalty. If I was to be able to give them options to move however, May trailed off as Naruto's eyes widened at the thought. You would part with ninja clans from your ranks. That's a major surprise. That's the same as giving up some of your power isn't it? Yes. Though, like yourself, I too would love for a world where people can learn to get along and have peace. Kiri has only recently finished fighting and killing each other. Tensions are still high and we don't want to start that again if we can help it. Anything to bring down the chance for hostilities will be appreciated. In the long run, it'll be more peaceful to allow for the two clans I have in mind to resettle in a new ally's borders rather than our own. Plus, you can call it a major apology for the way we entered your country, and for some of our sins from the past. While it wasn't her that had ordered the destruction of the previous Izushio, that didn't mean anything to civilians for sure. Bad blood could and usually did run deep. Naruto nods, thinking it over, while Hanata leans into his ear now to whisper to him, it would be a good idea, extra ninja clans will only increase our power after all. A sly grin works its way onto her face as of course she can't let Ino get ahead of her, plus just think, if we do this she might consider this as you doing her a favor. Wonder what she would be willing to do in order to repay that. Naruto leans away with a grin while more thoughts swirl in his head but he keeps on track. What plans would you be thinking about sending our way? Mei snaps a finger and Chojuro comes forward to unseal a blue folder and hands it to her. Smiling and thanking him, making him blush, the older woman opens it and pulls free two pages that she turns and slides Naruto's way. Two clans specifically, both rather, less well known. One was nearly wiped out, the Yuki clan, while the other has been a long-standing clan that did not produce ninja. The Zosensho clan, very literal, a clan of shipbuilders. They've become very isolationist since the bloodline purges and hardly ever respond to our summons. Watching Naruto take up the papers that summarized both what the clans were, their approximate numbers, and their requirements, she smiled as Naruto's face lit up without him noticing. I've met a member of the Yuki clan before. Though, he was sure he was the last of his clan. It's sad to learn that he had family that could have loved him. Naruto remembered Haku and his pain. 
This would have been a great village for Haku and Zabuza if they had survived. And a clan of shipbuilders, ha. Huh? That could be interesting. He would have to meet with them first of course, but ultimately he didn't have an issue with clans resettling in Azushio. They would go through the standard probation like everyone else. In the end my goal is to build a world that has the ability to become peaceful. Where conflicts can be resolved without massive bloodshed. May smiles and points a well manicured finger towards him, I wish for such a world as well. Naruto slides the papers towards Hanata for filing, if such a concession is going to be made on Kirikaga's part, then Azushiokaga wouldn't mind eventually becoming full allies with you. Opening our borders to Azushio for trade and commerce would be a good start. Showing her relaxed nature she grins at him, by the way. I've been hearing much about the Uzumaki tradition of bathing skinship. I would be interested in learning more about it. Since you're doing me such a large favor. Chuckling and shaking his head while ignoring the glares from Aon Chojuro, Naruto waves a hand to ward him off. The Uzumaki like to talk and settle family disputes and make plans in the bath. We consider it a space that lays bare not just our bodies but our feelings and emotions. Giving him a sultry smirk, May can't help but tuck a strand of hair behind one ear and preen a bit. I would like to join in on one of these sessions. Tonight, perhaps. Naruto's laugh is a bit more strained, and it's Hanata and Ino who save him. Ino winking at the older cage, I'm sure it will be a wonderful time. The young woman looks up to her guards, your guards are welcome to attend of course, though be warned, us Uzumaki girls can get, violent. May shakes her head ready to wave them both off before thinking about it. Ao was instantly out, the stick in the mud, but Chojuro might be some fun. Chojuro may come, but Ao likes to bath alone. So he will most likely stay behind. Having the younger boy with them might help with his confidence a bit as well. Or at least might shock the shyness out of him. Ao takes a half step forward with his hand outstretched, Mizukage sama surely I can. May turns a baleful eye towards him, are you going to argue? Tone sweet, everyone can detect the danger there. Mouth snapping shut, Ao shakes his head quickly. Why did his cage have to be so reckless? And why did he keep somehow pissing her off? The rest of the meeting would proceed with a bit more routine. Trade ideas, cultural exchanges, nothing was off the table at the moment. Kiri wanted to show itself as a new and revitalized village on the world stage, while Azu was rebuilding itself and rebranding as a force to be wary of. It would not be all roses right from the beginning, both leaders knew that. But here in this office both could see that the other only had the best interests of their people at heart. That was a wonderful place to start they decided. B. Along the wooded area of Wave at the western edge of the island stood the team of Neji, Kana, and Jin. Night had fallen, but they had been instructed that the border seals had picked up a team attempting to be sneaky. Kana and Jin were standing together while keeping an eye on the surrounding area, while Neji stood before a pale brown elk golem with large antlers. It would have passed as a real one from a distance if not for the rocky skin and glowing blue eyes. Its mouth was open, and Karen's voice issued out from it. We've been watching them since they left the main road and attempted to avoid the bridge. It's the sound four and they are attempting to enter wave by crossing the strait. It had been a long time since Karen had seen the group, but she could never forget them. Ever. No other patrols have made contact yet, and yours is the closest. Should I direct back up your way? No. We can handle this. Our weapons need a proper field test after all. Any special orders concerning the group? Neji would take any advice he could get from the Uzumaki woman. She knew more than him about their targets after all. The one with two markings on his forehead and pale skin and pale hair. That's Kimimuro. A bone bloodline limit makes him extremely dangerous at close range. At the least you must kill him first. He's fanatical and will not surrender or bargain. The other to worry about the most is Saken. Well it's Saken and Akon. They both have bluish hair and pale complexions. Though they have a habit of covering one eye and wearing lipstick. They're brothers that inhabit the same body. A con can inhabit your body and kill you from the inside out. Again, kill quickly and without fail. The other two, Kidomaru and Jirabu, the one with six arms and the one with the mohawk respectively, aren't as skilled as the others. Kill if you must, but capturing them would be a nice little bonus for Naruto I think. I'm sure he would like some words with them. Neji nods, understood. We'll get it done. The elk bows lightly, we'll keep an eye on things on our end. 
If things go south we'll dispatch two teams to your location ASAP. And absolutely worst case we'll activate the swarm. Understood, we're heading out. Neji nods to the others and they take to the trees, heading for a cliff that overlooked the nearest beach that was closest to the border with the land of fire. Kana and himself activated their Byakugan as they ran. Failure is not an option. Kana smirked, or, do you want to make sure you bring a big fat present back for Uzumaki-sama? Think he'll praise you for being such a good boy. Jin chuckled, he's gonna yukin you into next week again. That had been a fun spare when they had first teamed up. His arms still ached in phantom twinges. Neji shakes his head, I'm merely doing my duty as ordered. That he did want to go above and beyond to put on a good showing for his new clan meant nothing. He was just trying to help put the best foot forward. I mean, if he wants to poke at me a bit I'm not going to complain. Kana smirked as their team leader stumbled a bit. Scoring herself a mental point, she added it to her list of, help her distant cousin loosen up, scorecard. Lady Hanata had been very firm about helping Neji. Plus, he was very handsome, that helped. Neji shook his head as they reached the cliff and he spotted figures running out along the water. Found them, looks like a few minutes out before they reached the beach. He was already unslinging his bundle from his back. Kana was soon next to him, doing the same, should we kill them before they make the beach? Neji shook his head, sharks will eat their bodies before we can recover them. That's a long run. They'll most likely rest on the beach to recover their chakra before continuing on. See that rocky overhang to the north? Kana nodded, eyes tracking a bit to her right, yeah. That'd be the safest place for them to stop. It'd give them cover from any potential roving patrols. But not us. It's a straight shot. Jin however relaxed back, hands linked behind his head, that's like, a mile or two away. Think you can make that shot? Neji only smiled, not a problem. Unwrapping his bundle, it was a long wooden metal construction. The metal tube was roughly a meter long and had two sections which could be split open near the base, which he did in order to load two things inside of it. First, a specially made senban about as thick as a finger into the longer section, and next was a tightly packed explosive note into the shorter breech. Folding the weapon back together, he flicked forward two legs towards the end away from him and set up on the ground. The spring engineers were calling it a chakra rifle, because it used their chakra in order to ignite the seals and launch the senban. And apparently the inside of the barrel was etched in a process called rifling in order to give the senban a spin to help with stability. And god was it effective. With a little practice I've had no problems hitting targets as far as three miles, though those were stationary. Even a mile is pushing it for moving targets. If this worked, he was absolutely making sure every member of the ninja members of the Hotaru clan received training with these weapons. Kana set up next to him, folding her own weapon together and keeping her eyes active, which means if they don't stop best we can do is aim to wound them and close in for close combat. But if they do stop, Neji's grin only became more sinister. If they don't stop we'll take the shot as they approach the hill leaving the beach. But if they do stop, I'll take Kimimuro, you take Saken. Roger that. They both watched as the Sound 4 continued their run, cresting and jumping over the waves as they got closer and closer to the beach. It was with a satisfied smile that Neji was proven correct as the enemy team made landfall and immediately dove under the outcropping of rock to rest and gather themselves. Neji brought the wooden stock of the rifle to his shoulder, on my count. 3, 2, 1, fire. Applying chakra to the top of the tube at a specified point, there was a sound like thunder, and both he and Kana watched as their senban was sent faster than they could follow down range towards their enemy. They had a moment to appreciate that all of the sound ninja turned at the massive sound that cut through the night. Then they set about reloading. Kidomaru was just looking around at what sounded like echoing thunder. There wasn't a cloud in the sky however, so what the hell was tar? His thoughts were interrupted as Kimimuro's head was severed from his body, neck vanishing with a whistle and an explosion of gore and blood. In the same breath, the top of Saken's head simply ceased to exist. His body took some of the momentum and was launched away from him a bit before landing to pulse and twitch among the rocks, blood pumping from a body that didn't know it was dying. Kimimuro's corpse did much the same, his eyes wide and mouth moving as he hadn't quite caught up with what had happened. Kidomaru was looking around frantically while Jiribu was already in the process of building an earth dome around them. What the fuck was that? 
Jiribu shook his head. I don't know. But something is making it hard for me to manipulate the earth here. Building a dome is gonna take a minute. Hurry the fuck up for Tass. We need to figure this out. Kidomaru was already activating his curse seal and pushing up his headband to expose his third eye. Akon, you dead too. Akon had already taken control, enraged and seal activating, whoever did this will pay. My brother, he, he, god damn it. He couldn't think about it. If he did, if he acknowledged it now he wouldn't be of any use. No, he'd take it out and whoever attacked them. Far away and reloading their next shot, Neji was already sighting on Kidomaru, they're putting up a barrier, better hurry. Kana frowned, god I need to practice more. She was half a second behind Neji in reloading and sighting their targets again. I'll finish off a con. She notices the transformation taking over Kidomaru and the bow and arrow he was making with his spit. Well isn't that cute? Neji nodded, we've only got one more shot at this. Three, two, one, fire. Another pulse of chakra, more thunder, and twin streaks of silver flew away. Kidomaru had been looking this time, bow and arrow made of his webs at the ready to retaliate. Jiribu's barrier was almost complete as well, but it wouldn't be enough. Seeing flashes of light from explosions, Kidomaru turned in order to see what had attacked them. He couldn't make sense of it however. It was too far away. Who could possibly attack them from so far? Having moved a tad however, his life was spared. His upper right arm was not. A good portion of his shoulder being ripped away from his body, he was dumped onto his back while his arm was sent flying into the sand. Screaming in pain and rage, he missed the other projectile slamming into the enraged Yukon's heart, obliterating his chest and blowing bits of his spine out of his back. Jiribu finally had the barrier tall enough to protect him from further attack, not that it would do them any good. Jiribu himself was panting from the effort. How had things gone so wrong so quickly? Neji stands, folding his rifle in two and wrapping it again so they could move quickly. We're going to have to get close for the last one. Kana followed his lead and looked to Jin, looks like you're up blood boy. Jin shook his head as the team set off, both of the Hotaru with their rifles slung on their backs. Blood boy. Kana nodded as she smirked at him from over her shoulder, you control people by their blood, so, blood boy. Jin could only sigh and nod, I guess that makes sense. What do we call you then, shooty zap fingers. Kana laughed while Neji shook his head, you might want to go back to the drawing board with that one. Either way, those rifles make you seriously dangerous at range. Why bother with anything else? Neji waves a hand around them, only good in certain conditions first. And second, while we're building them into our new fighting style, there will always be a need for close-range fighting. Uzumaki-sama could have flashed away and caught us within moments. And a more experienced ninja might have performed a shunshun in order to reposition so they could find us as well. Neji turned to look at Jin, long range is good, but remember we're still deadly up close. We do appreciate you as a backup. Jin grins while flexing his fingers, as they came with sight of the rock dome around the sound team. I'm so ready to capture these assholes and head home. I miss a warm bed and good food. Idly he activated his dojutsu. Kana teases him because of his enthusiasm. You must really love me to be willing to fight for me so earnestly. Jin decides to tease back, I'm actually fighting for Neji, not you. Oh just admit you love me. Like a bad rash. No that was just that civilian floozy you found the other day. Natsumi was a nice girl, don't put that evil on her just cause you can't get a date. I'm saving myself for Neji-sama. As a good wife should. I'll pray for our team leader's health. Prick. Stuck up see you. Neji sighed, shut it, both of you. We have work to do. Happy that for once both of them quieted down, they came upon the beach and the rock dome. Byakugan active, Neji had no worries and walked right up to it, eyeing it over for flaws. Jin, when the wall drops, capture him. No worries their leader. Jin held up both hands and waited. He could faintly feel another body beyond all that rock, but there was too much in the way. Shame. Neji wells up chakra in his hands, before furiously smacking several points along the wall facing them. Jumping away as the wall crumbled and Jiribu leapt forward in an attempt to catch him, Neji grinned as instead Jin caught the bigger teen in his hold. Perfect. Jin nods as Jiribu grunts and attempts to move, how are you, doing this? Jin shrugged though sweat was beginning to appear on his forehead, 
Did you know the human body, blood specifically, has a lot of iron in it? Neji unseals a suppression seal and slaps it on the other teen's forehead. Uzumaki-sama is going to have questions for you. Watching the bigger guy drop like a stone, Neji finally relaxed and released a breath he hadn't realized he was holding. Kana set about unsealing storage scrolls and sealing away the bodies. Kidomaru and Jirabu took special seals that could transport the living within a specialized stasis seal. Something Naruto and Karen had spent some time putting together. Welp, that's that, we all done here. Neji nods, accepting the scrolls from Kana and sealing them all away into a larger storage seal that he tied to the small of his back, all done. Time to return to Azu and make our report. Jin nodded, and then bed for a few days. I'm so glad we have mandatory time off. Maybe he could hit up Natsumi, see if she was still interested. Kana nodded, you said it. Say Neji, wanna bunk together tonight? I know that apartment of yours has to get lonely. Sighing and refusing to answer, Neji jumped away, Jin and Kana on his heels. Jin turned to the girl, he didn't say no this time. See, I'm making progress. Unless he's planning to beat the shit out of you again. Um, sounds kinda fun. Think I can get rope involved. You're so broken. Guilty, it was going to be a long trip home. B. Naruto sighs as he relaxes into his family bath as today had been stressful and busy. But here with Hanata and Kotohim at his sides, he had peace. Or at least, he should. Across from him is a serene may while a blushing Chojuro floats next to a tired-looking Jugo, both with towels over their eyes. The rest of the girls minus Karen and Honoka are relaxing about while Naruto and May chat back and forth. I haven't had the chance to ask. May's voice was like silk as she enjoyed the warm waters they all were currently sharing. Have you garnered relations with any other nations? Keeping his eyes firmly on her face, Naruto nodded and relaxed back a bit. We've actually pulled the land of hot water, frost and rice together under our banner. Wave and spring are officially just parts of Azushio. He waved a hand as he thought about about his next plan. I actually have a bit of an in with Suna, so they'll be the first major village to ally with us, officially that is. Honestly Naruto had never had a doubt that Suna would ally with them. Never mind Gara and he talking more often. Temari alone would make it happen. May smirks and trails a hand through the water, ooh, and what would it take so that Kiri could be, included, with those allies. Leaning back just a tad and watching her cleavage rise, she was only slightly irked the young man was being such a gentleman. I can be very, persuasive. One of the girls, Tayuya she believed, snorted loudly. Naruto chuckles and shakes his head, well, I won't lie. You are indeed a very beautiful woman Terumi-chan. But I'd like to think our future alliance should be based on something a bit more concrete, yeah. And benefits our citizens more. May nods in approval, I can see the benefits. Why, political marriages are very common still and it would secure a more lasting peace between our nations. I wouldn't dream of taking up more of your time than needed and I especially wouldn't look to replace your current wives. No no, just a bit of, fun, from time to time yes. Lips curling as she adjusts herself and gets a little more comfortable. Ino and some of the other girls begin to giggle while Naruto flushes at the bold mazukage. It sounds like fun to me. Ino never minced words anymore, always ready to speak her mind. Yet another bombshell surrounding Naruto, should we start a ranking? Tayuya was for once relaxed and resting against her friend. No wrestling tonight. That was for later. Finally rolling his eyes and figuring the Mizukage is teasing him, Naruto waves it all away, I'm sure we can set some time aside and negotiate about it later. That is what I'm trying to do now Uzumaki-sama. May shrugs and watches as his eyes finally dip a bit. Score. I hope it's working. If not, she raised herself up a bit, I can try harder. She had spent months hearing about the rouge that was the maelstrom. Blowing apart a biju, taking down bandits, saving princesses. Finally having him here, now and in person. And he was intelligent and powerful. The little girl in her heart had nothing but stars in her eyes. Kotohim grins from his side and nods for him, oh don't worry. You're having an affect on him. The girl set about giggling some more while Naruto slaps her hands away. Further away and doing their best to drift into their own world, Chojuro chats with Jugo. How do you deal with it? Jugo can do nothing but shrug, you get used to it eventually. He's almost immediately set upon by Kin and Sasam. 
Kin is grinning as she pulls the taller boy into her bosom, once you get over your nervousness it's pretty easy. Sassam pulls both of them away for a bit, we like to think of it as exposure therapy. Sassam mock whispered to the blushing boy, you could wander around a zoo for a bit, because of all of the wars and conflicts, men are kinder in short supply. Plus you're cute, I'm sure there are more than a few girls who would love to take a bath or two with Yah. Giggling, she wanders off with Jugo and Kin, leaving the frazzled boy alone. Towards the doorway from the changing rooms, naked feet slap against the tiles as Karen and Honoka finally make their way inside. Having spent most of the day in the basement and only coming up after receiving a report from Neji's team, both were rather tired and ready to relax, eat, and go to bed. Looking to finish up the duties, they both kneel at each of Naruto's shoulders, Karen leaning down to whisper into his ear. Neji and his team dispatched the sound for capturing two of them alive though one is critically injured and won't make it another hour after being removed from the stasis seal. They're all in the containment sector when you're ready. Naruto nods, thanks, that's some of the best news we've gotten today. He personally had wanted to reduce all of them to sludge, but dragging information out of them was a good idea. Plus, this was their reminder to go hunt down Orokimaru again. Old Snake's days were numbered. Seeing how tired their friends look, Hanata and Kotohim both kiss Naruto on his cheeks and float away, giving Karen and Honoka room. Naruto gets the message and a glint enters his eyes, you know, you're still in trouble for spending all day in the basement, like I told you not to. Quick as lightning his hands snaked up to grab both girls and drag them into the water with a splash. Resurfacing with sputters and coughing, they both blush as Naruto wraps possessive arms around their waists and pulls them into him. We'll be having a talk about it later. Karen is blushing heavily, of course, Naruto-sama. Honoka nods and tries to hide her own blush, yes, Naruto-sama. May can't help but smile at the blatant show of affection. Such a strong presence. Naruto decides if she's going to keep teasing him he might as well do so in return and shoots her a grin, just wait, you haven't seen all of my presence just yet. Relaxing for a moment and missing her own blush, he decides someone else needs a reminder of just who and what he is. Raising his left arm he channels some chakra through it and seven seals grow to life on his inner forearm. Honoka dear, could you poke one of those? Honoka nods, reaching up and choosing the one directly in the middle. It flashed blue once before going dark. Was that all Naruto-sama? Naruto nodded, Prefect Honoka. Completely perfect. Everyone was looking to him for an explanation while he relaxed back and returned his arm to around Honoka's waist. Idly rubbing a hand along her side and tummy, just saying hello to an old man is all. Hanata nods and leans into Kotohim, must be Jiraiya-sama. Ino giggles, that old perv. I can only imagine what they pass back and forth with seals. Tayuya looked Naruto's way, cracking her knuckles, better not be anything about us. Naruto shakes his head, I'd never share you. No no, just a hello, nothing more. B. Far away in the land of fire while sitting in his office, a smug Danzo works through paperwork while in a good mood. He considers that by now Sai must be close to delivering his payload for the Uzumaki brat. He hoped the boy liked his present. Mentally doing a victory lap, his attention is drawn away from his work. Something, was it squeaking? No, a scratching sound. He had never had mice in his home before. Kanoa was full of cats and they did a wonderful job of keeping the mice and rat populations down. Standing and looking for the noise as it was a bit louder, Danzo couldn't help but allow some irritation to work onto his face. No one was here to bluff or order around, so he felt safe letting some emotion show. Walking around his desk in his study, the sound was coming from one of his plants in the middle of the room. Coming up to it and running a hand through its thick leaves, Danzo pauses as he tried to rationalize what he is seeing. At the base of the plant and hiding among the leaves was a Naruto. Only about three inches in height and dressed in his old orange jumpsuit, the boy was giving him the finger, suck my miniaturized cock you miserable bastard. Even his voice was squeaking and cute. What wasn't cute was the bubble that suddenly surrounded Danzo, taking on a deep yellow tinge as his plant began to glow brightly. Welling up his chakra and unbinding his right arm, he only just makes it as the explosions begin. Late at night though it is, Danzo's home is lit up briefly, the explosions real time lasting no more than a few seconds, while Danzo himself endured three minutes of constant assault within the barrier. 
Three minutes of fire, light and heat that ripped him apart and reduced him ashes. When the smoke cleared, Danzo stepped out of the crater in his floor, everything that had been caught in the barrier reduced to ash and charcoal, while he himself was unscathed. Frowning at the two Uchiha eyes that were now closed on his arm, he set about rebinding them while he considered what he was going to do. The boy had forced him to use as a nagi. That was, more than a little concerning. And apparently the boy was still alive. Wonderful. What else could go wrong? Deep below the Uzumaki Tower were several basement levels not available to either civilians or the fledgling normal ninja forces. Sectioned off for those of John and Rank or for specialized circumstances like those of the Border Seal Monitors, these levels housed several of Azushio's Black Ops projects. From the level dedicated to Karen's Golem projects and her medical experiments, to the level dedicated to the Border Monitoring Seals and staff, to further down the prison cells which currently only had one inhabitant. Naruto walked along with Karen at his side, a frown on his face as he considered how to handle things. Kotohim and Tayuya were taking the Kiri group on a tour of the city before they leave to return to their own island. They had decided to formally sign a tentative alliance treaty this morning, and Mei was going to spread the news of their alliance among her people along with the news that Mei would be sponsoring Naruto and Azushio as a full ninja village. For now Naruto and Karen are making their way down to the prison area. Karen walks along just in front of Naruto, clipboard in hand and making notes as she explains what has happened with the captured sound ninja so far. Kimimuro is a goner one way or another. Even with my best healing and the medical tubes, reattaching his head just isn't possible. Boo with his body as intact as it was, there's a chance we could revive his clan. Surely we could have more than enough volunteers for such a project. Even she knew the male to female ratio in their country was a little off. Wars did crater the amount of men left after all, and most of their people had come from either war-torn nations or prisoners of Orokimaru. Naruto shrugs and isn't too happy about the idea. It seems both disgusting and wrong. I don't like the idea of doing the same type of experiments that Orokimaru or even Danzo would get up to. Karen nods, I figured you would say as much. But, his body does have abilities that could help medical advancements for others. And like I said, I would want to use volunteers for this. We wouldn't force anyone into anything. Think about it, I'm sure there are more than a few women out there who would love to band together to start a ninja clan. Or even current ninja who wouldn't mind adding the Kaguya blood limit to their own. Karen would ultimately forget the entire idea if Naruto said no, but she would at least push as much as she could. She truly did only have the best interests of Azushio at heart. Seeing where she was coming from Naruto concedes that point, we should keep his body under stasis for study for now. I'll think about possibly reviving his clan in the future. But if you can help people medically in the meantime, I'm okay with you working on that. Making a note and breathing a small sigh of relief Karen continues with her update, Sakens and Yukon's unique ability is simply too dangerous to do anything safe with it. The ability to merge with another living being and even torture or kill them is just... It's way past inhumane as far as I'm concerned. I'll trust your judgment on that. Unless they have a bounty on them, go ahead and burn their corpse. Naruto wasn't about to spread that ability around if he could help it. The thought of someone being able to take over his body just gave him the creeps. I'd more than likely just burn them out with my chakra if they tried that on you. Oh, yeah, that's a good point, huh? And you're a cage now. Maybe give the chair to the bookworm, she's the real brains here. Everyone else is smart, I just blow things up. You don't say. Karen flags that in her notes, I'll get to that in a bit then. From here they come to a clean room with medical equipment on one side and a medical bed on the other. Waving a hand to the shackles and restraining bands on the bed, Karen turns back to Naruto, we can remove Kidomaru from stasis and question him quickly, though he likely won't survive. He had lost a lot of blood before he was sealed, and most likely he'll still be able to use his curse seal. But this would be the most appropriate place to do it. Naruto ponders that for a moment before coming up short on their count, what about the last member of the Sound 4? Checking her notes for a moment, Karen points back towards the door, we have Jirabu in a cell, since he wasn't injured and had been bound with ninja wire and chakra suppresses. He's been pretty tight-lipped about things so far. I want to talk to him first. See what he has to say. Naruto watches as Karen nods and they leave to find the cell block. As they walk, 
Karen adjusts her glasses and looks over her shoulder. Have you slowed down at all with your training? Naruto nods slowly, just a bit, keeping up with our workload has been an adjustment. What about you? Still working exclusively with your seals and chains? For the most part, I want to reach the level that our ancestors apparently had. To be able to restrain a biju completely on my own. Honoka is much the same now that she has a home and more free time. She's been training much like myself. Make sure not to burn yourself out okay? We still have a long way to go. Karen grins, locking eyes with him as they turn a corner, don't worry, I won't be training or work any more than you do. That she was smirking had Naruto shaking his head as they came upon the prison cells. Rows upon rows of them, but only one was occupied. They meet Jirabu, clothes still filthy and splattered with blood from the disastrous beach entry. Naruto walks up to the bars covered in seals, giving the bare room a once-over. There was a slab of rock that served as a bed and a toilet in the corner, nothing else. So, you're one of Orochi team's men. Wanna be a good boy and tell me what you're doing here? Jirabu had been stewing here on his own since his capture. He knew the others were dead, Kidomaru's injury wouldn't have been survivable even with his cursed seal. That meant he was alone here. Looking up, Jirabu takes in the blonde with mismatched blue and purple eyes and the traitor Karen standing slightly behind him. Baring his teeth, he focuses on her, you bitch. You had one job and you couldn't even handle that. When Lord Orokimaru hears about this he'll burn this village to the ground. Just you wait. Shaking his head, Naruto squats down to look Jirabu in the eye, Orochi team and I have some unfinished business. But I'd prefer if you answer my questions, before I start getting stabby. Jirabu scoffed, I'll never talk. Lord Orokimaru's will is absolute. He'll destroy everything you love right in front of your eyes. Rolling his eyes and rooting around in a pocket for a moment, he eventually comes up with a light green scroll. Unrolling it and tearing free a foot-long section, he places the pre-made seal across the bars, Naruto nods as the cell itself glows the same light green. Okay, let's try that again. Why are you here? We were ordered to find you and kill you. Jirabu's eyes widened. Why did he just answer him so easily? Why couldn't he say anything on his own now? Grunting and straining, he locked suddenly fearful eyes on the grinning blonde. Yeah, you never had a chance there. So, where is Orokimaru? To the west in the land of rivers. There's a base there near one of the border bridges. Naruto looked back to see Karen taking notes and he nodded and continued, how many sound bases remain? And what are they for? Three that I know of. The one I mentioned, one near the land of lightning and one in the land of wind. Both of the others hold prisoners and experiments. If I let you go, would you return to Orokimaru? I've spoken of too much. I would bite off my own tongue. Naruto hummed at that and thought it over. Eventually he thought about Ino and snapped his fingers. If your squad had been wiped out at the border, would you have returned? Yes. Naruto goes back to grinning, taking out a full suppression seal and tossing it onto Jirabu's forehead. Within a breath the large teen was slumped forward on his knees and Naruto was standing to remove his truth seal. Karen was still writing notes though she watched as Naruto opened the cell and removed sealing ink and a brush. That was a curious move. What are you going to do? Just provide a little present for Orokimaru, can ya go get Ino? I need some memories wiped out. Oh yes, Naruto decided. Just like Danzo, Orokimaru was going to get a little get well soon gift from him. You don't mess with an Uzumaki. B. Far away in Kumogakur, B is standing before his cage in his office. Alone. The rest of the group had been sent to the hall and it was now only the older A and the Biju container facing off. The atmosphere is oppressive as neither one truly knew what to say to the other without things turning instantly into a shouting match, until with a sigh B shrugs. There really wasn't anything for it. I told you violence or seduction weren't going to work especially being in the land of hot waters. Conflict there is a one-way trip to a small war. A scowls, you could have dragged him back here like you were told. Surely some barely trained brat wouldn't have put up that much of a fight against you. B shakes his head, that would have leveled a good portion of the land of hot waters. The kid is strong and talented, he took on the Suchikage's daughter alone and unprepared along with her backup. Sure I might have been able to beat him in a fight, but there was no guarantee. The older Jinchuriki knew he could have beaten the QB container in the end, 
but he was being honest about the level of destruction needed to do so. And if one of this wives had gotten hurt, B shuddered at what might have been. A scoffs, does anyone here care about what happens to a buffer nation like that? I think you're both overestimating the boy and making excuses for just enjoying time outside of the country. He was untrained, there should be no issue overpowering him quickly. Which until a saw the boy for himself, he would be hard pressed to believe that some barely 15 year old kid could do that much damage. Bingo book entry or not. B is still shaking his head, one hand coming up to scratch his head, Mr. Nine seals are nothing to sneeze at, never mind some of the techniques I had a chance to see. No, me and Guki are strong, but tanking a blast that could create a mile wide crater did not sound like fun. Stewing in frustration, A finally sits back, go. I'll deal with you more later. But find Yugito and send her to me. B nods and leaves, long strides carrying him to the doorway with a rare scowl on his own face. He just knew A wouldn't be letting this go, even if he probably should. Outside and sunglass covered eyes landing on the younger blonde, he hooks a thumb over his shoulder, bro wants a word. Seeing the woman nod he tosses his hands into his pockets and trudges off. His entire demeanor screamed leave him alone, and everyone within the building was more than happy to do so. Behind him Yugito gives everyone left a confused look before heading inside to stand at attention before her cage's desk. A looks up and watches her for a quiet minute not saying anything. Sniffing, he lays his hands on his desk, I am a little disappointed but I realize that it was my brother, not you, who drove this mission to failure. So instead I'm going to give you a mission all your own. Seeing the woman stand a little straighter but not respond, or internally grinned. There have been more whispers that perhaps the maelstrom is in the land of waves. And that there might be a new village building up. Go, ask around, find him, and complete the mission. Bring him back. Yugito nods, am I to complete this solo or with a team? A waves a hand in the air, alone, only return if there is a major complication. His eyes harden a bit, and it better be a major complication. Do not return otherwise until your mission is complete. Yugito bows, what about the others? A waves them all off, the rest are dismissed but they need to submit formal reports. I want to see everyone's different opinions on just what went wrong. Yugito bows again and leaves, silent steps taking her back to the reception room where the rest of Simwi's team and Simwi herself were waiting. I'm being sent out, everyone is is to remain here though you need to submit reports about this debacle. Simwi is curious but realizes it's going to be a shit show. You've got your work cut out for you. Guess the vacation was over for now. Yugito just shrugs, I have my orders, as do you. I have to see them through. Whether she liked them or not. B. In the island nation of Wave the sun is bright and large fluffy clouds floated by overhead. It was a good omen as far as the combined group of Kanoa escorts and the Suna group were concerned. Crossing over the Great Naruto Bridge, the combined group enter the Land of Waves. Those that haven't seen the bridge are impressed and express their feelings as such. It was a marvel of engineering and the monument to their own Team 7 sent a few teasing remarks towards Sakura and Sasuke. Sakura can't help but grumble, Naruto's ego can't possibly get any bigger. You'd think that he'd consider changing the name or something. Next to her Sasuke nudges her. Though she was mumbling, he knew what she was saying, better remember to play nice. I will. Sighing and heavily shrugging her shoulders, she leans into him for some support, think everything will turn out alright. Sasuke didn't really have an answer for her, hopefully. With everyone here, hopefully we can ditch Sai. We can hope. Ahead of them a smiling tsunami was waiting with several aides. Temari was waving to the woman with a wide smile. Good morning Tsunami. Good morning Temari. We welcome you and your group to wave. If you would all easily give your id numbers and names so that we can register you for the duration of your stay, that would be wonderful. All of her aids begin to spread out to the other teams, while she personally and quickly registers the Suna group. Kiba grumbles a bit about the process, what do we need to register for? Not like there's a ninja village here to worry about. Kakashi turned a focused eye back on the genin, you might not be aware, but normal nations fall prey to ninja all the time. Taking precautions is a smart thing to do among normal civilians. Asum shrugged after he gave his own information to a pretty brunette with jade eyes, even with this. Ninja could, you know, lie. Tsunami is walking towards Team 7, a smile still on her face, 
it's just a part of our new policy is all. Please don't worry, your information will be destroyed upon you leaving the country. She comes to stand before Sai personally, eyes lingering on him the longest before her smile brightens just a tad, name and ID. Taking down his information as he gave it, she soon floated away to walk beside Temari, will you need anything for your visit? Temari shakes her head, we should be good. We secured a room at the Evergreen Hotel. But I'll make sure to stop by sometime during our stay. With a bow tsunami and her aides form up away from the group, thank you for your time everyone. I do hope you enjoy your stay in wave. They soon melt back into the crowd. Soon lost and out of sight, it unnerves the group just a bit. Shino raises an eyebrow that goes unseen, are we sure they aren't ninja? Kakashi shakes his head, last I checked no. And we had a mission here pretty recently. Sakura shakes her head, wasn't it like, a year ago now? Sasuke thinks on that one, hand playing with the end of his new chokuto, has it been that long already? Time sure did fly when your friend was running all over the nations. Kankuro turns back towards the leaf ninja as Temari begins leading their brother down busy roads, come on. We've got rooms for you all as well. Making their way through the market, the various teams all take in the city around them. As they wander by a weapons shop, Tenten nearly plasters herself against the window, look at that. They have tridents and spears and fish hooks, it all looks really well made too. It would make sense, they did start out as a fishing town. Asuma looked around at the more big city feel and mentally made the switch that this wasn't a small town anymore. More of a shipping hub these days. Sakura nods, and to think, if Gato never tried to squeeze them for all they were worth, it might never have happened. Kakashi chuckled, think Wave should build him an altar in his afterlife. Fat chance of that. Sakura shook her head as the street widened and they watched as trolley cars rolled by slowly with supplies from the docks. Guy noticed it and put a hand to his chin, hum, heavy transports by rail. Smart for such a civilian heavy country. Kankuro called back again, keep up wood ya. You can sightsee all you want later. Temari looks back as the leaf group is amazed at the progress of wave, taking in the sights and sounds. You all have rooms within the evergreen on our dime, but from here on you're on your own. In three days time we'll meet back up in order to return to Kanoa and then the land of wind. The squad leaders all nod and they all decide to check into their rooms first upon reaching the hotel. The entrance hall for the tall and gleaming hotel is a grand affair, lots of granite flooring and tall glass windows gilded in silver. Temari was quick to get the group checked in with the receptionist before tossing room keys to the separate Jonan. From there and a few rides up quiet elevators, the various leaf Jonan find their rooms and begin issuing instructions to their teams. Guy has led his team into a large room that offers two bedrooms and a main sitting area. Though for now he stands before the couch while his genin all sit before him. While we are here we can't train, but you should endeavor to be on your best behavior and explore to your heart's content. Enjoy your youth and kindle your passionate fires. Kiba knew what sort of fires he wanted to kindle, wonder if there's a beach nearby. Shino sighs at the usual nonsense from his teammate and friend, your labado will get you in trouble one day. Lee thrusts a fist in the air while taking Guy's words to heart, we should explore the docks, never know what we'll find. Kiba shrugged, not a bad idea. There might be a boardwalk of some type. Bet there would be plenty of cute girls there. One room over Asuma is giving the same type of speech to his own team, I shouldn't have to worry about you three correct. Choji already has a bag of chips in his hands, I wonder what kind of food a seaside port city could have. Surely they had to cater to a wide range of tastes here. Wonder what type of cuisine they had to offer. Tenten is actually curious about that as well, well I do want to check out the various weapons shops around here, but we could go on a foodie tour at the same time. Shikamaru can't believe his luck as it seems like the day might be rather chill, I'm down for whatever. So long as we take it easy. Team building would be good for them in the end. Another room over and Kakashi has given his team the same speech, though within a breath of finishing there's a knock on the door. Sasuke opens it and Kankuro comes in. Yo, you actually don't have time to relax. Temari wants your team with us. So let's get moving. Kakashi is surprised to say the least but nods, guess that's that team, forget the time off and head out. Team 7 heads out of their room and meets back up with the Suna group in the hallway. 
With a nod from Gara they head back down the elevators and leave the hotel, treading through the city. Temari turns and walks backwards to talk with the squad, I'm sure you'll be surprised but this isn't all there is to wave, there's actually a real and separate capital city. Though we'll have to travel by train to get to the island that it's on. Idly she watches Sai's face, and notes that he doesn't even twitch in surprise, though the other two at least try to pretend. Sai speaks up for once with his mind fully on his mission from Danzo now, that's an ingenious way to hide a city. Must have taken a lot of time to build. Temari nods as she turns and comes back to Gara's side, it surprised me as well when I met the leader before on my last trip. But he was looking for allies and Suna could use those right now. Thoughtful and considering how to get this information back to Danzo Sai only nods and falls back into his normally quiet facade. Sakura and Sasuke share a look but say nothing as the group continues on up the main road towards a tall and gleaming concrete and glass construction that was even now look BB still receiving work and a paint job. It was truly impressive, especially with the amount of people they could see going in and out. Even Kakashi gives a low whistle as they finally reach the train station. Gara is the first to raise his eyebrows and speak up. I can see why they wanted so much glass making sand and marble stone shipments from Suna. Ahead of them they see a pair of familiar faces, Hanata and Ino stand before a single car train trimmed in reds and golds while waving to the group. Temari is the first to walk up to the pair, of course they send you too. Or what, did he finally get bored of Yara and wanted to make sure I got here safely? Ino rolls her eyes and hugs her friend, oh stuff it fangirl, we volunteered to come and get Yara. Weaving around the other blonde to spy her pink-haired friend, Ino ignored the commentary between Temari and Hanata to sidle up to Sakura and wrap her longest friend in a firm hug. Hey there billboard brow, missed ya. Smacking her friend in the shoulder as they pulled apart, Sakura was smiling all the same, you better watch it. I've been training with Sunid and I'm getting pretty strong these days. I think I could take you this time. We can spar later and find out. Hanata however is clapping her hands together to gain everyone's attention. We do have a schedule, so if everyone could board so we can set out. Face open and sincere, the group does as she asks and boards the train quickly. Following inside behind everyone else, Hanata floats to the front of the car while Eno makes sure everyone finds a seat. You know, if you're here, then that means he's here yeah. Sakura was doing her best to play along as Eno sat across the aisle from her team. They were trying to keep Sai in the dark for as long as possible, though Team 17 wasn't sure why the Uzumaki decided to let him come along. They knew he was a plant. And they knew Danzo was up to some dirty shit. Oh well, it wasn't up to Sakura to figure it out. Ino nods, yeah, Naruto's back in Azu, hard at work as always. You'll see him probably, smirking and laying it on kinda thick, she wondered if Naruto was right. If Sai would make his move soon or not. She personally hoped he didn't do anything at all. So many things could go wrong. Or how is the little brat? He finally starting to grow a little bit or what? Kankuro is leaning out from his own seat while Hanata is walking back towards them and the train jolts a bit and starts to make its way down the tracks. Hanata herself can only smile and gentle push a finger into his forehead to move him out of the way, please remember that little brat nearly killed you. Hey, well you know. If it was a proper one-on-one -on -one it'd be different. Temari rolled her eyes and pointed a finger at her brother, you do remember what he did to a transformed Gara, right? You really wanna take that on one-on-one. -on -one. Temari shook her head, be my guest. I'll be there to console him when you die. Don't you mean Gara? To console Gara? Oh of course. That's who I meant. The twinkle in her eyes told Kankuro a different story and he laid out on the table. Gara Temari is getting that look again. Make her stop. Kankuro wasn't whining. No, men didn't do that. Gara just leveled a bored look towards his big sister. Do you have to tease him? It's my job, still wish he'd stay out of my makeup though. It's war paint. Through it all Kakashi watches the quiet and very introspective Sai. Unintentionally just like the others he really hopes the boy won't try anything. Never mind the ramifications for what that would mean for relations between Kanoa and Azushio. He was worried about what it would do for relations between Team 7 and Naruto himself. Sure the boy would know they didn't want him here, but if something happened, emotions got the best of them all. The train rattles along and they make the trip easily enough, 
coming out the other end and stopping among a just as grand and busy train station. Following Hanata and Eno out through the crowds and brightly skylight lit walkways, they come out to see a fresh and green countryside with a growing city not that far in the distance. Buildings stretching into the sky though many still have scaffolding around them, the group could still acknowledge that the progress here has been immense. Eno directs them to a trolley which they board and begin to make their way towards the city center. Hanata clears her throat to gain everyone's attention, the Uzumaki Tower is getting some retrofits at the moment for an airship demonstration, so there might be some construction going on when we arrive. I hope you understand. Gara sits with his arms crossed but quietly watches the scenery float by, Suna is very interested in that technology as well. Tunneling to the land of wind is a decent idea. But airships capable of shipping and transport would be easier to use right away. Temari nods, plus it would be a lot less resource intensive on our end, though we won't see as much traffic. Hanata smiles and nods, we will notify you when the first demonstration is set to occur. So you can see the proceedings for yourselves. Sai speaks up again, curious about what he heard, you said it was the Uzumaki Tower correct? Why name it after your clan? Flicking her hair over her shoulder, Ino jabs a thumb into her chest, cause we live there. The Uzumaki mansion is housed on the upper floors. Sai nods as the group continues on their journey. Sakura eyes the boy but raises a hand much to curious smiles from everyone else. What point is there to airships if you can easily use trains? Looking at each other for a moment, Ino eventually points to Hanata who sighs and answers, trains can only run along their rails to locations that we've built. Airships can go anywhere and land even in areas that don't have the specialized landing pads so long as there is a large enough clear space. So exploration, travel to rocky or mountainous areas or long distances over the ocean would be available to airships but not trains. Satisfied with the answer and curiosity sated, Sakura nods and sits back, I wonder if we'll find other ways to fly in the future. I'm sure we will. The spring engineers are hard at work all the time now coming up with new and interesting inventions. Hanata had no problem praising the men and women of the engineering corps. They did amazing work. Coming to the city center, Ino leads the way off of the trolley as everyone follows along behind her. She leads them to the Uzumaki Memorial where the Leaf and Suna Ninja read it over, smiling while offering prayers. Laid to rest are the bones of the betrayed, but the dreams of peace live on. We are a people of resilience, of strength, of love. For the peaceful future we all wish for, never forget the fallen. Sai however, seeing everyone distracted, slips away into the crowd and enters the Uzumaki Tower. Free to think, he wonders if this'll be good enough for Lord Danzo. He did want him to target the Uzumaki, though with his stolen bomb this would surely do more damage than just destroy the tower. Oh well, it wasn't for him to think about, he was just a sacrifice for Lord Danzo's will. Pausing as he reaches the central pillar containing the elevators to the upper floors, Sai consults the ceiling to consider if this is as close to the center of the floor space as he was going to get. Someone steps forward to question him but Sai ignores them. Sir, are you okay? Do you need assistance? The nameless functionary was not new to his job, having been at this for months now helping people navigate their way around the tower and to their destinations within the city itself. This odd and very pale teenager wasn't all that strange in the long run. Except that he refused to answer him. Young man. Hello. You're blocking one of the elevators. Do you need something here? Looking at the man for a moment, Coming up that this was a civilian and not a ninja, Sai augments himself with chakra for a brief moment and backhands the assistant away. Gasps and worried voices rise over the din of the usual human noise, but Sai isn't focused on that now. Unsealing the scroll he had received from Danzo before further unsealing the scroll stolen from Naruto himself. Jumping and landing on the ceiling, sticking himself there with chakra, he notices for a moment that as people are rushing out of the building quickly, Team 7 and the Suna group are trying to rush towards him. It would be unfortunate that the Kazekage would die this time, but surely it would be to the Leaf's benefit. Eyes finding his temporary teammates who in their own way had tried to help him warm up a bit, Sai offers them an actual genuine smile, Chakra beginning to pump into the scroll. Sakura however is frowning, twin kunai appearing in hand as she's already winding up to throw them at the boy, Sai. What are you doing? Her scream is tinged with rage. Why had Naruto been okay with him coming? It made no sense. And now he was going to use one of Naruto's crazy bombs. Sai just shakes his head, 
several Azu ninja jumping towards him, for Danzo Sama's will. Scroll beginning to pulse and glow orange, Sai releases his chakra from his feet and begins to fall. He was going to die, one way or another. But that was okay. His ordeal was finally over. Pulsing picking up pace as everyone watches on, Sai is startled as several ninja dog pile him and drop him to the ground, sealing his chakra with a sealed tag while binding his hands and feet together with ninja wire. Next to them the scroll was visibly vibrating and still glowing brightly, while Team 7 looked on in horror. What the, Kakashi was a second away from attempting a reikiri on it just to see if it would work to disable the bomb. With a pop, the scroll sizzled and stopped illuminating the room around itself. Returning back to its normal form first before a small Naruto puffs into existence on top of it, mooning Sai and giving him the finger. Oh you thought ha, huh? but it was me, Naruto, muahahaha, better luck next time. With another puff, Naruto was gone. With a ding, one of the elevators opens and the real Naruto himself steps out, flanked by Karen and Tayuya the teen cage was all grins as he walks up to the restrained Sai. Naruto knows he won't get anything out of him right now, being one of Danzo's root ninja after all. But they also knew how to free him, if he wanted to be freed. So instead his eyes trail towards the members of the Chinoik that had been on duty today, take him to a cell. I'll deal with him later. Yes sir. Saluting to Naruto, they pick up the boy and take him away to the elevators to make the trip down below the tower. Naruto takes another few steps forward in order to pick up the stolen scroll, took the old bastard long enough to find one of them. Applying chakra to it while the others rushed to come towards him, they all retreated to the sight of the sealed scroll crumbling away into dust. A new more genuine smile on his face, Naruto gives a lazy salute to Gara, yo. Welcome to Rizushio, where we specialize in taking down crazy ninja and making things go boom. Shaking his head and walking forward, Gara holds out a hand which Naruto takes and shakes happily, Temari said you can never stay out of trouble. I'm almost worried what an alliance between our nations will be like. Ah it'll be fine. Mostly, probably. Turning and finally seeing everyone else, Naruto waves to them, so you finally get to see my new home. Sakura is the first to leap forward to hug him tightly, you ass. You could have warned us that you had something planned for Sai. Sasuke was nodding along with her eyes smiling Kakashi, she's right you know. We were trying to figure out how we could ditch him at some point. Gara shrugs, I think it was a good show, really drives home that Izushio can defend itself. Naruto nods as Sakura steps away as Karen and Tayuya sidle up next to him and give the greetings. Don't worry Jarl, I'll explain everything later once we get upstairs. Boo. As an apology, how about something special? Holding up his left arm, Naruto channels chakra and reveals the row of seals there, though one is dark. Here ya go Sakura, pick one. Call it a gift for not visiting enough. A gift ha. Huh? Eyes wide and knowing better than to question him before she did as he asked, she chose the one on the far right, closest to his wrist and watched as it went dark. Nothing happened, but Naruto released his chakra and allowed his sleeve to fall back into place. Now, let's get upstairs and get this meeting started. And afterwards I'll make sure Team 7 can come and go however they please to Rizushio from now on. Laughing and turning back towards the wall of elevators, Sakura only watches as everyone starts to follow along behind him. Hanata nudges her to get moving, don't worry about it. He'll explain it eventually. Sakura can only sigh. Why do I get the feeling I've just become an accessory to something horrible? Turning to look at the shorter girl, her worries only increase as Hanata just walked beside her smiling. What do those do? Oh nothing to be worried about. I am so worried. I am all of the worry right now. Hanata however just pulls away to join the Suna siblings, leaving Team 7 with Ino and Tayuya. Naruto made me blow something up didn't he? Far away within Kanoa, Danzo is walking away from the Hockage Tower after a minor council meeting. Having no real concerns for the rest of the day, he decides that maybe a check-in with his route would be a good idea. That decision made, he's forced to pause as a cracking noise reaches his ears and he loses balance. His cane decided now would be a good time to break, splitting down the center. Concerned at the bad omen, he eventually comes to the conclusion that being superstitious over it wouldn't do him any good. He had this particular cane for a long while, things break over time. He continues on his way, 
making sure his limp is much more noticeable since he didn't really need the walking aid in the first place. He hopes that Sai has reached the Uzumaki by now, and idly thinks about what he'll do if the boy does end up dead. Certainly Kanoa will need to secure what's left of him and his clan, for protection of course. Never mind the funds that are sure to be recovered. Dropping into an alley and running chakra along a wall, a secret entrance into the root tunnels is revealed. Making sure as usual that no one is nearby, he steps in and starts to make his way much more naturally. He doesn't flinch as the wall behind him closes back up, nor as torches light themselves to show him the way. The hallway he found himself in was a long affair, one way in and out for a few hundred meters, but he preferred it this way. Made it impossible for someone to sneak up on him or lay a trap. At least, that was the goal of it. Because at the moment he can hear footsteps beyond his own. Someone was following him. That should be impossible. No one else was in the alleyway when he checked, and he couldn't feel any other chakra signatures near him. Still, he pauses to look behind him, seeing no one there in the long hallway. Maybe he was finally getting to be a little too paranoid. Turning back, he sighs as he sees yet another small Naruto there. This one however came up to his knee and was very much a girl, dressed in a bikini of orange and black. Danzo sighs, just knowing this wouldn't end well and running wasn't an option. Are you here to waste more of my time boy? Flipping her ponytails over her shoulders, the girl Naruto idly cleaned under her nails with a kunai, depends, you gonna keep trying to kill the original. Danzo shakes his head, you have no proof of anything involving me. So be careful with your actions boy. The chibi clone takes a long look down at itself before cocking a hip one way and then the other, first, I'm a girl. I know you're old and your eyesight's probably real bad. But these tits are too rockin' to be a boy. And second, you could at least be better at lying. Old codgers like you should be good at it. I'm not in the habit of lying anymore. I'm too old for it. The clone shrugs and winks at him, yeah, keep telling yourself that. Yar ne. The explosion was sudden and intense, and as Danzo was suddenly covered in liquid fire that adhered to him like jelly, prompting scream of agony from his throat, the older ninja lamented the other problem with a long featureless hallway. There was nothing to substitute with. Within another breath Danzo is stepping back into reality, looking back at the fire-covered hallway and the small crater where the clone used to be. Another eye sacrificed, and that began to prompt some real worry in him. Because this meant either Naruto knew he couldn't die, or the truth, that he had a set number of resurrections. Both situations worried him immensely, but there was no going back now. Both men were set on killing the other. And as Danzo turned to continue on his way, now much more alert, he was determined to see the boy die, just like his clan had. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.